Uh, so Jonathan and I, we thought we'd kind of uh, double head this final one. Jonathan and I are from the Beeb, um, and we've had great fun with Node for a few years now, um, as I hope you are in, in where you work as well. Uh, we've done loads of stuff. We've done websites, we've done APIs, data handling, we've, we've used stuff to power our apps, we've put Node on tellies, we've even put Node in outer space. We'll come more onto that later. Um, we've had great fun with it. Um, and in, on the time we do, we've kind of learned loads of stuff, as you do, and we've... Um, come up as a result with these eight principles that we follow to make sure we get things right. Um, uh, you won't be surprised to hear the BBC has a lot of people who use it, uh, who rely on it, and get rather grumpy when it doesn't work. So we have a, we have a, a real desire to keep things fast and reliable and scalable. Uh, very important for us. And so we've come up with these eight principles, uh, and we'll go through them now. Uh, they probably don't all exactly work for you. We've all got different problems, right? Different approaches. So um, I doubt all eight will immediately apply to you, but hopefully they'll get you thinking a bit about you know, how, how they could apply for you and what you do differently. Um, and I'd be delighted to talk to you about after, afterwards if you have any views on that. Uh, we've been doing Node in production, kind of corporate enterprise production stuff now for three years. Three years, right? I mean, that, that's amazing by Node standards, isn't it? We must be one of the first to do these things, right? Um, I know, you know... If, COBOL developers will say they do things for 50 years, but, but, but this is Node, right? These are like dog years, aren't they? they yeah. um, so, uh, and, and as we heard earlier, we shouldn't have been doing this because 0.10, as we were at the time, really wasn't the kind of thing you should do production stuff on, but we did. And I'm glad we did in hindsight because, because it's given us that, that experience that means where we are where we are today. Um, and just, just to kind of show you a few things that we do, this is uh, what we call the BBC homepage. It's the first thing you see if you visit bbc.co.uk. Entirely written in Node. Seven million hits a day, so it's a really busy page, entirely written in Node, and there's even a customise button so that if you, you, can, you can say what the things you like and you can get our Node servers to create you via React exactly the page you like. Right? So it's pretty, pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, they're running to a very large level indeed. Um, here's another example. This is the coverage of uh, last week's UK local elections. Ah, pretty boring point local elections, isn't it? But to, a, to, a, to the, um, the national broadcaster, this is as important as it gets, right? Imagine if we got the wrong result in here, you know, or we, we, we crashed at the wrong moment. It would be bad news, right? And we trust Node for these really important things. That's a good story, right? And uh, another event, if you're a footy fan, this was uh, a week last Monday when Leicester won the English Premier League without even playing, rather impressively. Um, uh, uh, this, this page, uh, this Node page, uh, uh, was incredibly busy. So in the, it, we had millions of people use this. Uh, the BBC website at this time had 16,000 hits a second on it. An extraordinary number. Not all of them were to node pages, but the, the, the biggest ones, the pages covering this event, were node pages. Uh, so an extraordinary amount. And my favourite stat is, one of the node things we've made is a, uh, a WebSocket service using Socket.io. So I'm guessing a few of you here have used. Um, we, we, we connect anyone to... to, to any, any page that has kind of breaking news or anything changing to, to our Socket.io service so that we can send them the very latest change as soon as they get it. So as soon as the score changes, the goal goes in, we can send that within a second of us knowing about it. And at the final uh, point, the final few minutes of this match when everyone was there, we had 1.4 million web sockets open. That's 1.4 million individual connections to 1.4 million people just so that we could tell them you know, that it's full time, it's two all, and Leicester have won. That's awesome, right? Don't let anyone tell you that Node isn't ready for big time. That is huge, right? It's great. A um, couple more things. Uh, this is a picture of an internal tool we have, which we have hundreds of journalists using in order to create content. Um, this, this, I mean, it's obviously not quite the same scale thing, but it's great the way we can build these things so quickly, right? It's a React thing. It's a very uh, reactive interface where, people, where, where our, our journalists can dynamically change what's happening live. Works really well. So our, you know, end to end, our stack has Node right the way through it. Um, this is a screenshot of, uh, if you are British, you'll know the concept of red button where you can press. And if you've got a smart TV and you've plugged it into the network, uh, we now have a full HTML JavaScript experience where you can, uh, where you can interact with news, weather, sport, that kind of thing, uh, and iPlayer. And more and more of that is being powered by Node as well. So kind of Node powering TVs. That's pretty cool, right? Pretty different to normal. So loads of stuff and loads of people. And, and that was just to kind of help explain why it is so important that uh, we do get the, the, the ability to scale and be reliable and be flexible right. Uh, we'll go on to those eight principles in just a minute, but I think, Jonathan, you're going to talk a bit about uh, a little bit of history and how we got here. Hi, everyone. So if you think back to 2012, four years ago, it was the London Olympics. Hipsters weren't a thing. <laughs> um, the BBC and development at the BBC 
was completely different than it is today. It's probably a very familiar story to all of you. We were very much a traditional web shop. We had a Java services team that produced APIs, that took data, that mangled that data and produced an output. That team was entirely separate from the PHP front-end development team. We didn't really have JavaScript engineers. We had a little bit of JavaScript on the website, but not very much. We didn't use Node. We didn't have any internal Node tools. To build something and get something out onto the website in front of people took about two weeks. And the process of doing that was committing your code, pressing a button on the build server, going making a cup of tea. When the build had finished, you'd copy the RPM, the name of the RPM that had been built, and you'd put that in a ticket. And then you'd send that ticket to somebody in a different building who would install it, and they had a little batch, um, a little, uh, batch file in the DOS prompt that used to go through and copy it to every single ser server individually. It might break halfway through, so they had to start again. There was no such thing as continuous delivery. There was no continuous deployment. Testing was entirely manual. So it was a week of regression testing the entire site for one line of code. And it's probably a familiar story for, for many of you. So at the end of the Olympics, we delivered the Olympics, the website, hugely successful. But we wanted to do things better. We wanted to move faster. We wanted to be more agile. We wanted to be able to react to change, deliver things in a, in a more efficient and cost-effective way. So that's where we started to improve our development practices. We wanted to move to continuous delivery, deployment. We wanted a faster environment to develop with. Node was the way that we wanted to go. So four years on, we're still on a journey. Not everyone has moved over to new ways of working. People have taken slightly different paths in the BBC. But throughout the BBC, there's common patterns. There's common learnings. There's common understandings that we've, we've picked up. And what we're going to share with you today are eight principles we think help you build reliable, scalable, and resilient applications that can scale to the numbers that Matthew was talking about. All right, let's get on with it then, shall we? We have a slide on each, uh, each one tenuously linked to a random BBC picture. Uh, first of all, uh, veteran weather presenter Michael Fish, who I presume is retired. Did anyone see him on TV recently? He looks like he's old, doesn't he? Um, uh, okay, so uh, Michael introduces number one, which is the design as microservices that embrace the elasticity of the cloud. There's that word again, elasticity. Um, we're all on the microservices bandwagon, aren't we? Right? That, that's, that's a given now? Yeah? I think, I think there might be a bit of uh, difference in how micro, microservices are. Um, with the Lambda stuff, almost encourages really small, doesn't it? Single operation stuff, single API endpoint, that kind of stuff. Um, we, some, when we talk about microservices, we, we often talk a bit bigger, and we kind of treat them as nano services. Is that a phrase we use? And um, uh, we think microservices is a bit bigger than that, but it's basically not the Java monolithic do 101 things on a thousand different threads model, isn't it? It's the, it's the, it's to say Node is awesome at doing one thing really well. That it's asynchronous, single threaded. Uh, you know, protect, protect the event loop approach means it's really good to do one thing, but you don't really want 101 things happening in your same uh, Node instance, right? So, with that in mind, that elasticity word again that Luca was mentioning before. Um, here's an oddy picture of a load balancer in VMs. We use uh, AWS's Elastic Load Balancer. It's brilliant. <laughs> really helps us scale. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so this this number one is hopefully nice and obvious. Uh, you we, you embrace that elasticity, right? When the load comes along, you bring up some more boxes, and you have whatever it is. It doesn't have to be a load balancer, of course, but you, you have whatever it is that's distributing the load. Simply spread it between more boxes. Easy as pie, right? Many virtual machines or instances, whatever you call them. Um, uh, you may be running more than one uh, node instance on each or just one. We like to run generally just, just one, go for really cheap virtual machines with a single core and run loads of them. That's generally the model we do. That's that we mentioned before where we had 1.4 million people connected via WebSockets. We, uh, we had 450 uh, instances running at that point. And uh, to AWS, it doesn't care. It has many, many more. You can just scale up to that. And then an hour later, when they're all gone, you scale back down again, right? So you only pay for the bit you use. So financially, it should work out quite well if you get it right. 
Uh, you always have at least two, of course, because that way if you've got a failure, um, that you can replace any that become unhealthy. Um, uh, and yeah, I guess that makes sense, right? Pretty straightforward, this one, isn't it? Not rocket science. But speaking of rocket science, number two comes from the International Space Station. Everyone know who this is? Show of hands. Uh, I've had a few. This is Tim Peake. He's our first, well, yes, first British astronaut. Is that right? British astronaut. He's not our first British astronaut. Um, he's a British astronaut up on the space station at the minute. And he said, I want to write Node in space. Well, no, he didn't. He said, I want to watch rugby in space. Close enough. So he wanted to watch the Six Nations. And as you do, NASA phone Matthew. That must have been such a cool phone that call. That was awesome. <laughs> Hi, this is NASA. Is there any way we can get Tim to watch the Six Nations up in space? Well, sure, that's a challenge. We like a challenge. So away we go. And we, a uh, bit of work later, we managed to get him able to watch a bit of iPlayer up on the International Space Station. Powered by Node, though. So we like the fact that we've got a Node app delivering content to the space station. We, we think it's running the space station for a while. We think it's a good thing. Anyway, what does Tim say? Tim says something. Of course, he says, scale up like a rocket, down like a feather. So we know that scaling is important. We know that we're able to build single purpose applications that do a, good, do a single job, that do something specific. But knowing when to scale is very hard, very difficult. When do you choose to scale? What metrics do you use to decide when to scale? So for example, if we've got a queue, and that queue's got loads of messages on it, do we use the size of the queue? Do we use how old the oldest thing is on the queue? Do we use the CPU of the box? Do we use the memory usage? Do we look at the, the disk access? Or do we look at the uh, network I.O.? How many IOPS we've got left on the box? Sadly. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution to this problem. It depends on your situation. It depends on your environment. It depends on what you're doing. But scaling is hard. It requires effort. It requires work. And it requires time to finesse. And you have to keep going back, revisiting as your platform grows and as you evolve your system. It's not something that you can do once and then say, that's it. It's going to work forever. You have to keep coming back and revisiting it. So we were talking about the push earlier. What we try and do is, if you can imagine the, uh, the client load is the, the blue line, so you can imagine our, our user base growing reasonably quickly. Um, we try and build up so we're always ahead of the curve. But that's quite difficult. Something like the BBC gets very bursty traffic. So an example might be a major news incident where we just can't predict the traffic that's going to come to us. Equally, we could have a presenter on TV that might say, go to the website and vote now. We just can't predict that traffic. So being able to adapt very, very quickly and be able to adapt at the right time is really important. Which leads to another question. How often do you try and scale? When do you try and scale? It's another challenge that you have to face. So scaling's hard. But you don't want to scale up and stay up for too long because it become, become quite expensive. The cost, the cloud might be great at delivering the elasticity and the scale that we need, but we've got to be cost effective. Two, uh, 25 cents an hour is cheap, right? But that's $2,000 a year. That's quite expensive. Costs soon add up. So we need to come down quickly, but not too quickly, otherwise we'll knock people off. So scaling is hard requires effort and work, and it's something you have to maintain and look after. Cool. Definitely one of the sexiest projects uh, this year, working with astronauts. Brilliant. OK, um, let's move on to number three, uh, brought to you by the back of Paul Weller. Um, uh, at uh, Glastonbury last year, Glastonbury, one of the things that our, our Node websites help cover online. Um, this is all about, again, about the load. And just look at all those people. What's that kind of problem, is it? Do you really understand? The load. If you're, if you're worried about that load that's going to come, that traffic, if it's a website, do you really understand it? Are you ready, ready for it? Um, we've found that, great, you can auto-scale, uh, you can use that elasticity, you can do it really quickly, as Jonathan was saying, that's wonderful. But uh, until you really try it, you don't really know what's going to happen. 
let's take that Noddy diagram we had before of uh, a few machines, low balanced. Uh, if that was a web server website, then uh, you probably would have some kind of database powering it, right? Fairly standard architecture. Uh, problem is, when you then come to autoscale, you may autoscale your machines, but not your data store, because how you autoscale, how you scale each bit can vary considerably. Or you, maybe you're not paying enough money to Amazon for their DynamoDB, right? Um, it's only, we find, you've got to theorize about it where you can. You've got to try and work out what's going to happen as a result of the scale. But only when you try it do you really know what's actually going to go on. Um, every architecture has its weakness, right? So there's always a point where uh, you're going to keel over. Uh, we definitely had a few cases where things slow down because the database is struggling. So what happens is we scale and add even more boxes, which makes it even worse, right? It's, uh, it's a challenging one to get right. A uh, couple, of, couple of real examples for you. Uh, this uh, complicated, colorful diagram is uh, one modeling we did. Uh, this isn't actually a node uh, application, but the same kind of principle. Each of these boxes is a, uh, a service or a database or a cache or a CDN or something like that. And we've literally modeled what we think will be the amount of uh, traffic it will, each will get, the amount of calls each will get, and what the consequence of this going down. Right? So we can make sure that each one of them is ready for that big event. Uh, uh, last year as well, we talked about this, which was, uh, again, for that WebSocket service we mentioned before, uh, we needed to load test it, and we couldn't find a good WebSocket load test service out there, so we made our own. And we ran it last year live at Node Day, if you guys were there, uh, and uh, uh, nearly broke the BBC website, which is good. Um, how are we doing for time? Do we, should we try it? Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Let's okay. try it again. We're, 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 um, we're really struggling with... Uh, internet connectivity. So let's see if this is working. But let me just set this up. Let's get that page loading. Um, Everyone can shut the laptops and turn the phones <laughs> off. Give us more internet. Uh, yeah, we've... Um, oh, long story. We've been having issues. But hey, that was not working. Lovely. OK, so this is our um, simulator. So let's ask it to run 200,000 uh, connections. So this is basically saying, what would happen if 200,000 people came to our website, sat on it, and demanded some information, right? I'll set everything else up. And in theory, if the, uh, uh, come on, if, if the internet connection is working, it's not looking like it is. Oh, no. Yeah, it's gone again, hasn't it? Oh, what a pity. But what would have happened is the numbers would have gone up, and everything would have been fine, right? <laughs> uh, should we have one, one more try? Um, we... Uh, just as we're testing this, we found a bug with one of our pages where it's downloading uh, tens of meg just to stay updated that we hadn't noticed before on our nice fast networks. There we go. Oh, it is working. There we go. So um, it's climbing its way up to 200,000. Uh, so far, I've done 12,000, 18,000 now. We've got a 0.01% failure rate. We'll get someone fired for that. Um, <laughs> and uh, th what this is happening is this is the actual scaling here. So I don't know if you can read these words, but basically, um, we are scaling up, and it's... it's um, uh, you realize the current capacity is 39%, so loads of capacity. But um, all being well, that will be going up. No, we've lost internet again. But all that, that will be going up and up and up. And eventually, these are all the boxes running. Absolutely loads of boxes. We must have had a busy thing happening earlier in the day because there's a load going on at the moment. Um, and we've got loads of capacity at 39% for some reason, so we must have calmed down a bit. What, but what would happen over time is that number will go up, and then we'll hit a point, we'll trigger that point to which we need to scale, and automatically new boxes will come along. We'll pay for them for the, for the hour we need them or whatever. That makes sense. It's worth pointing out that we are doing this test on production yeah. in front of the audience. Yeah, so we should have said that. Yeah, that 119,000 that's already there, that's actually real people, plus that few thousand that we started, isn't it? So we could try this one more time to see if it's... Uh, uh, see if you can come on. That's so that 119,000. It's probably a much bigger number, right? Yeah, it should be. And maybe this one's going up. Yeah, so we're now at 50,000 people. Oh, our failure rate is 0.11%. That's terrible. Um, Nah. Come back at the end, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is the page we found that's accidentally downloading tens of megs uh, just to stay updated. Um, the wonderful irony that the one page we have that doesn't use WebSockets uh, to update is this page, because this is the page we need to stay working when our WebSocket service fails, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anywho. Uh, oh, there we go. OK. Uh, let's move on to number four. Okay, so uh, this is a picture of inside one of our buildings. 
And one of the, uh, the banners that we've, we've had up, and we need to find it out again because it's soon time for the, this Olympics, is uh, the Olympic broadcaster. So we're very, I'm very proud that, to work for the BBC, and I'm very proud that uh, the BBC is the official Olympic broadcaster in the UK. One of the challenges that events like this bring are scale beyond proportions that we would normally face. And so how do we continue to grow and scale our systems when we've reached the limits of scaling? So Matthew talked earlier about a data store. What happens when that data store reaches capacity and we can no longer scale? Well, there are things such as sharding we could do, but we can also make our systems more efficient. And building event-driven architectures is one way of doing that. A node is exceptionally good at doing event being an event-driven application. So a great example is a journalist can create an author content. So a new story or information on a specific politician. Uh, so say, for instance, a journalist writes a small bit of information on David Cameron. When they post that information, that data, we, we've got two choices. That data can sit there and wait for the users to come along. And every time a user comes along, we do some work to generate that content. The alternative, which is the traditional event approach, is we listen for changes. We listen to a queue. And when that change happens, we pick the work up and we do the work that's relevant to deliver the content and make it ready and push it to the edge. So when the audience comes along, it's ready for them. Traditional event-driven architectures. We then scale based on the work that we need to do. So as more work goes on the queue, we add more boxes. And hopefully, we should have... I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we should have more VMs. Nice and simple. The problem is it doesn't always work for us. We have a very long tail at the BBC. We've got... If you publish a topic about politics, well, that's going to update millions of stories across many, many years. So event-driven isn't always the most efficient. So how do we get around that? So the approach we tend to take is a hybrid. We always try to be event-driven, but we only drive out to the audience if people are interested in the content. So we have a hybrid, hybrid approach where people listen, uh, people come to the website, consume content, and if people are actively consuming content, then we'll event drive out to the audience. Otherwise, we'll just wait for the next person to come along. So event-driven architecture helps increase our load, our ability, um, by becoming more efficient. Great. Four down, four to go, uh, and we're... Running a little behind, we better up the pace. Okay. okay. All right. Number five is brought to us by Microbits, who you may have heard of. We've made uh, a million of these and distributed them to every 11 year old in the UK to help them do programming. Disappointingly, the language you use is Python, but I'll try and change that to Node for the next batch next year. Um, these were given out free, but in practice, microservices aren't free, are they? Um, there is the uh, financial cost of running them, and it's, it's looking like uh, cloud cost. Uh, engineering is becoming a huge area, isn't it? Uh, but actually, the bit that's hurt us isn't that financial cost. It's what, what was uh, discussed before a few times today, that overhead in just looking after all those microservices, right? That, that cost of each one being developed, tested, released, kept up to date, and so on. It's uh, quite an overhead. It looks brilliant, doesn't it, on, on architecture, when you have all these wonderful individual boxes all doing their own thing. But then when you come and have to make 30 different services, it gets quite hard. And there's many, many answers to that. Once again, that phrase, serverless computing, uh, I, I agree with you, Luca, that the future is not yet here in that regard. Um, uh, Lambda is a, a, a nice idea and useful in some cases. I think it's particularly great when you want to take something off the queue and process it, uh, but it can be challenging to do anything particularly large on it. The day will come. Uh, at the BBC, we are working on stuff in-house to help us with this bit because the idea that you can have functions which can easily be uh, deployed and you don't have to worry too much about where or how they're running will be a wonderful thing, right? One day we'll get there. Until there, just beware that cost of having lots of microservices. Number six. Okay, so this is about testing. So um, we used to test, we used to test um, in very 
manual, manual tested uh, fashion. We always used to do full regression tests. Where we are now is a world where we have a good testing culture. And good testing always starts with a good culture. When you start the next new project that you do, set yourself this challenge. When you commit code, in 20 minutes, it will be on live in front of the audience. When you've got 1.4 million people consuming a page and you know that when you hit commit, it really focuses the mind, really makes you, you, you focus on, is my testing right? Is it good? Have I talked to the right people I need to talk to? Have I engaged with them? So make sure you have a good testing culture. The thing is with testing is no matter how much you do and how good you are, and even if you remove all the manual steps in the chain and you can go out there within 20 minutes, you will still have problems. Things will still get to live which are cause issues. But that's okay. We think that's all right. You just have to design and build your code and infrastructure to deal with these problems. Um, so one great example we had, and there's a link at the bottom that you can't see, um, which is we, we deployed a bit of code. It takes something off a queue. It does a fetch, fetches from a data source, does a JSON parse on that, and then stores the contents of the result. Turns out that JSON parse with items over 100K and a special character bombs out. If you can fix the bug in the call, we'd be very grateful. That's what the link is to, it's to the, uh, the issue in the call. Um, and that's an example of something that we would never catch until we go to production. Thankfully, we were able to scale out, figure out what the problem was, go forwards after that. So testing in production, as long as your culture is good, is the way to go. Alrighty. Uh, number seven, brought to us by Danger Mouse, is be two steps away from catastrophe. Uh, yeah, so when you have kind of V8 bugs, as Jonathan just mentioned, you're, you're never going to catch that. Or you're never going to predict that kind of stuff, are you? It's just going to happen on production one day. And let's face it, in the continuous delivery world, where you're getting stuff to live in 20 minutes, you're going to get some bugs there, aren't you? It's going to be the way it works, right? Um, so this is the idea that we need to be fault tolerant. We, can't, we, we can never be bug free, but we can be fault tolerant. If one of the microservices fails, you don't want them all to fail. You don't want that domino effect to happen. We have had that happen in the past. So try and make sure that uh, each of your uh, microservices is as resilient as, uh, as, as, as reasonable to do so, um, so that if one fails, the whole system can somehow hobble on until, until the problem is fixed. We've had quite a few cases where we've had our node apps crash every minute, you know, uh, you know just uh, uncaught exception kind of stuff. And uh, you know, PM2 comes along and restarts it, or um, Amazon comes along and restarts it, or whatever it is. Uh, and we've had the points where we haven't noticed for days. It just, it just happens, right, because, because somehow things hopple on. Uh, so uh, we need to improve our monitoring a bit there. But uh, that's the right thing, right, isn't it? That when, you, when you don't want to be called at 3 in the morning, you want stuff to somehow survive the night when there is an issue. Um, Try, I called it be two steps away from catastrophe. I don't like the kind of remove single points of failure, uh, uh, which, which is traditionally how this stuff's been called, right, isn't it? You, you should always have two servers or two data centers, right? That doesn't work, does it? If you have two servers you, and the first server fails, your second server's probably got the same buggy code, right? It's, it, it, it doesn't work in that way. I'm always jealous of our, um, our colleagues in broadcasts, in the broadcast side of the BBC, because they do have two of everything, that's great. When the, when the video camera fails, you just plug in the other video camera. It's great, right? doesn't work so well for us. Um, so uh, resilience is the order of the day with the microservices, of course. Lastly, number eight. OK, so writing good node apps, being a good JavaScript engineer requires skill, requires expertise. And I'm sure everyone here is uh, complete experts. What's hard is the infrastructure on which your apps run. That's equally as hard as a problem as writing the app in the first place. So one of the things you have to do is make sure that you spend time and effort and resource into building your infrastructure, understanding your infrastructure. Traditionally, some of the JavaScript engineers we've had have come from a web development background, not a systems design background, and therefore don't have necessarily the skill set to run infrastructure and understand all the nuances and complexities around what's happening when, when we put infrastructure in the cloud. So bring perhaps your Java engineers who um, are now being skilled up in Node to ask the hard questions, to challenge the problems, build a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team, that's hard to say, that um, are able to deal with the infrastructure problems. And to, the team working together will produce a better output. 
So infrastructure is hard. Thank you, Jonathan. Phew, all eight's done. Uh, let's very quickly run through them. Uh, number one was we're all embracing microservices, which means that they all do one thing, which means that uh, scaling up becomes uh, a, an easy thing to do in theory. Uh, number two, uh, scale up quickly if you can. You don't need to scale down quite so quickly, probably. Uh, number three, do understand your load. Don't just rely on scaling to handle your load. Number four, uh, event-driven approach is one way in which you can help with that load because you can change around your architecture. Uh, number five, beware the cost of microservices, not just financially, but uh, that cost of actually creating and maintaining them. Number six, it's fine to test on production. It is where you'll find your juiciest bugs. Number seven, try and be two steps away from catastrophe. Try and have enough resilience so that when one thing fails, the whole thing doesn't go down. And last, become great at running that node infrastructure. It's not just a case of running PM2, as we've found. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, as I say, they won't all be exactly right for you. We all have different ways of working right, but they've worked for us. And as we said at the beginning, that we've, we've done some pretty huge, pretty awesome things that have genuinely scaled and worked well on the, on the, you know, the most important moments. Um, which, so we found that these eight things have really helped us you know, make sure that Node becomes freaking awesome in the BBC and it's working well. Thank you.